Hello, Chart Watchers and Decision Point Faithful. Welcome to this Friday, February 22nd Decision Point Show with your hosts, Carl and Aaron Swenlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Let's go ahead and take a look at what we will be covering today in the Decision Point Show. Uh, we're going to look at the daily and weekly charts uh, for the scoreboard indexes, IJH and IWM, our S&P 400 and Russell 2000 ETFs. I'll show you a price relative chart with the S&P. Then we're going to look at our DP indicators, of course, the ultra short term, short term and intermediate term. Uh, Carl's going to cover the big four dollar gold, oil and bonds. And then our bonus material today, we're going to continue to go over the accumulation distribution versus the OBV. We had started that last week and we're going to finish that. We'll be looking at uh, bull, bear and bull chart. I'll leave that for you to wonder about. And then we're going to take a peek at the OBV that we saw at the October top. How's everything going in Redlands today, Dad? Uh, clear and windy. Yeah. We still have a little bit of snow on those hills behind us. And uh, it's a very strange thing in Southern California, especially to see snow on my hills, which honestly, I've lived here how long? Um, almost my entire life. And I've never seen snow on these hills. It's quite crazy, but uh, hoping to warm up soon. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I wanted to first show you what's going on with the decision point scoreboards. Uh, we did get two new signals today, and we're going to take a look at those weekly charts for the OEX and the NASDAQ 100. But we did end up getting uh, buy signals uh, for our intermediate term PMOs. And that means that the PMO had a positive crossover on its weekly chart. So we'll talk about that. And then I thought I'd show you a little bit of information about what's going on as far as the decision point sector scoreboard goes. And of course, the intermediate term trend model is based on 20 and 50 day EMA crossovers. So this tells you with all these buy signals that the 20 day EMA is currently above the 50 day EMA. Long-term trend model based on 50 and 200 day EMA crossovers. So the 50 is above the 200 on these buy signals. And of course the 50 is below the 200 on these sell signals. Uh, always like to see these flipping into a buy situation on the intermediate term trend model. That generally means things are headed in the right direction. And interestingly, starting to see uh, these buy signals in the longer term. And we did add consumer discretionary last week. And you know that, of course, is a little bit more of an aggressive sector in comparison to these other buy signals, which are all sitting in more defensive sectors like healthcare and utilities. So I thought that was very interesting so far how we're doing. And then I wanted to show you before I go into all of the charts, this is a price relative chart. And basically what I did, this is the S&P of course up here. And then I did comparisons between the NASDAQ 100, S&P 100 and our mid caps, small caps. And then there's this small cap ETF for the S&P 600. And I just wanted to see which ones were performing the best and which ones weren't performing so well, because I think that can give us an indication of you know the bullish or bearishness of what's going on right now. And I have to say, I was very surprised. Uh, I noticed that our mid caps and our small caps are all uh, performing better right now than the S&P. And you want to see that kind of participation in the mid and small caps. Generally, when you get them on board, uh, that's, a, that's a good situation to set up uh, more upside movement or certainly to maybe get ourselves out of this bear market. Uh, and uh, the other thing I noticed as well is this is the NASDAQ 100 again. And you can see when we had this decline, we were seeing a little bit of improvement here as far as what was going on with the NASDAQ 100 being the tech stocks. And so seeing that improvement there kind of gave us a hint that maybe we were in for a pretty uh, nice size bottom. Uh, what's interesting is who hasn't been participating and that would be the S&P 100, those larger cap uh, stocks they've actually been underperforming. So we need to see them start to show a little bit more uh, leadership instead of our small and mid caps. But I still think this is probably um, a bullish factor to consider. 
All right, so let's start looking at some of these price charts. I'm going to start with the OAX today, just because we did notice that it's the one that's uh, not performing quite so well. Uh, NASDAQ 100, I'll take a look at that next as well. But what I've noticed is that pretty much on all of these charts, oh, back here, uh, pretty much on all of these charts, what we're seeing is these rising wedges. And I would say there's only one uh, that doesn't have one at this point. And I'm gonna try and get up there. My, my mouse is not cooperating. I don't know why it does this to me. <laughs> it's always right during the show. I never have a problem with my mouse. <laughs> no. Okay, come on now. Where's your trackball? <laughs> I know, I need to have a trackball instead of this. Uh, okay, there it is. There it is. Okay, so we have these rising wedges on the S&P 100, and we're starting to see some overbought readings here. Typically, our large and uh, the indexes typically uh, move between minus two and um, and positive uh, two. So usually, you'll see that kind of oscillation on PMOs. They have a range, and you know you can see back here we got extremely oversold. Uh, and now we're starting to see a little bit of deceleration going on on the S&P 100's PMO. And with this bearish rising wedge, that is suggesting we could see a decline. Um, Let me just comment that, you yeah. know, when you start a strong up, bull up move, typically the smaller cap stocks outperform the larger cap. So what we have is really a fairly normal situation. Mm-hmm. Alrighty, and here is the, uh, let me look at that NASDAQ daily chart again, because they're also not participating the way we want. And we're, we're seeing the bearish rising wedge there. And you can see even more deceleration going on for the NASDAQ 100. Although I have to say, when I look at an OBV like this, uh, <laughs> it doesn't concern me quite so much. Uh, well, it does me because you notice that where the price is, exceeding the December top and the November top, well, prices approach has not exceeded that yet. Whereas your OBV line is, is really blown past those levels. So you've got a, a reverse divergence, which is really not a healthy situation there. Right, so but basically what uh, you're seeing a lot of this uh, volume coming in uh, on that OBV, but we're not getting the kind of um, it, it's telling you that we couldn't get that high, even with that positive volume coming in. And then I'm going to show you the one that I believe is the only one without the wedge, and that is the Dow. It has been performing quite well. Uh, it got the long-term trend model buy signal before everybody else, and it, I would look at this and say it's in a rising trend channel. Um, so I find that kind of interesting as well, because we, we're seeing the S&P 100, those large caps, really not participating in this move yet. The Dow is, is doing quite well. So looking at just some of these weekly charts, uh, the weekly for the NASDAQ 100, you know, we're still on that rising trend. We can see the weekly EMAs are getting ready to have a positive crossover. And I said nearing a buy signal, but today we got that buy signal. It went final uh, because we did, of course, close business uh, at the end of Friday, and that's when they go final for the week. All right, and then we'll look at the weekly chart for the S&P as well. And this buy signal, of course, came in last week. Uh, the declining trend has been broken. This is probably one of the things I'm looking at um, is that rising bottoms trend line. Of course, we broke that rising trend, but now we're heading back up toward it. Uh, I'm, I'll be very interested to see what ends up happening when we hit that um, rising bottoms trend line. All righty, so I'm gonna move on into our, let's see, I'm gonna look at the IWM, because remember it, it is performing quite well. And there you can see the buy signal that has uh, that came in last week again, uh, and we're getting ready to, to try and uh, outdo these 2018 and you know, the first quarter uh, tops that we had. We're just coming up on it, so it'll be interesting again to see if we can pop on through that. All right, so let's look at some of our indicators that have just gone final. And as you can see, I haven't been able to update the annotations just yet. And this I think is rather interesting. So I am gonna put it in annotation mode. 
So we, we were seeing that decline in breadth, which, which was concerning me given the kind of movement we were seeing. Um, but now we just got that nice pop and here's another uh, climactic reading, I would say, on uh, the advanced declines. This isn't quite so climactic, but notice uh, we are near the top of that Bollinger Band. We're rising above that 15 level. Typically when you hit the, the bottom or the top of this Bollinger Band with really low readings, that's usually when you see a, a move to the downside. What would you uh, read this as a initiation or an exhaustion with these uh, climactic readings here? Well, I'm not, I don't like the, uh, the, the short volume uh, bar to tell you the truth. I, I, it could be an exhaustion climax on the other, you know, on the new highs and then uh, advanced declines. Mm -hmm. All righty. Save this. If you want to see these charts, they are in the Decision Point Live chart list. Just go to the Decision Point blog, and the link to my live chart list is right there at the top. So you can look at these at your leisure and copy them if you'd like. All right, these are our short term indicators. And I, I did spend a lot of time talking to you about this, Dad, before the, before the show. I'm going to make this a little bigger for us. And, you know, I had talked to you that. Typically, we just don't see um, divergences between these two indicators. It, I mean, I never really noticed them much at all um, before we had these crazy moves that we're seeing this year. And so I did start to pay a little more attention. And, you know, not that this tells you when you get these divergences that you're going to have a big time decline, but just the fact that when we do have them, it, it does tend to proceed a decline. So it, these could be an opportunity to, uh, we were talking about it before, confirm uh, or not confirm what's going on. And, you know, we are starting to get ready to hit this overhead resistance and we do have another divergence here. So I, I find that interesting and possibly we concerning. We just need to think of it as the, the, uh, the indicators are not in gear with one another and then that should alert us to look elsewhere or other problems. Right. Um, I didn't see this one updated yet, so this will be my first look. Now, we had topped on these indicators, and, you know, we keep topping above that signal line, and now we've, we've moved ourselves back up. Um, these are still extraordinarily overbought readings, I would say. I mean, we don't get the, these readings above 200 too often. Um, but when we do, and we, we end up getting those negative crossovers, it's generally not a good thing for the market. Um, I think with the exception of this particular one, I mean, it still went sideways for a little while, uh, and we did get sort of sideways movement, um, but we didn't get you know a huge decline off of that. So now we're still seeing them rise, and they're still getting more overbought. So uh, going to be watching that pretty closely. All right, let's get into the big four. So I'm going to pass it back to you. Okay, uh, I should, I'd like to say, to start with here that I uh, I have spent uh, a good part of the morning with these the big four charts and doing some analysis, but I don't have anything. I haven't had anything final on the market charts. You know, the S P 500. And these are the first times I had a chance to look at them, and I will, and I'll be doing the analysis on those in the uh, DP weekly wrap. Uh, but I haven't. You know, I'll have some time, maybe thirty minutes, to to, to grind it all around and, and uh, consider it before I make any conclusions. Mm -hmm. So, beginning with uh, with the dollar, it's I, I've. Uh, decided that's a rising wedge formation, which is going to, which is more likely to resolve downward. Yep. Let's try the weekly. Okay. And the PMO, of course, is kind of confirming that possibility. Right. And here uh, on the weekly chart, it's a different angle on the top, uh, on the top of the rising wedge. And when you look at it this way, you can see that price has not gotten to the top of the wedge and is topping out. And the PMO is topped out. 
So it's possible this is the beginning of the breakdown of that wedge. Okay. Gold naturally <laughs> out on Tuesday and uh, and just being cantankerous, it's pulled back. We had a we did get a, a pull back to the point of breakout and now it's starting moving up again. So I was look uh, hoping for another flag like we just uh, departed and then uh, we didn't get that. We got something up. But as uh, usual, it's hanging in there and it's positive. Um, and it's like the PMO, the, as you look at the PMO going along there in a flat line, but it's above the zero line at, at a nice chunk. And uh, so that means that we've got positive uh, pressure on, on prices there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, it, you know, if the dollar does fail, um, that, you know, could be an issue. But at the same time, when we look at the correlation, they're really not very correlated right now. So, uh -huh. all righty, here we go. Okay, with the weekly chart, we've got the reverse flag, which in a positive manner, price broke out of, up, uh, broke up out of, and uh, um, it's still uh, pretty uh, positive. I guess the last bar, though, if you put it on a, if you put it on a uh, candlestick chart, it would be a close to being a shooting star. Oh yes. So um, again, it, gold is uh, teasing us, but it's positive overall. Mm -hmm. All righty, next up. USO. We've got a reverse head and shoulders pattern, which uh, executed this week. Executed meaning broke above the neckline. It's not a decisive break yet. It needs to, a decisive break is 3%. And that's just uh, a rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. Not quite there. All righty. Weekly. And again, the weekly, we've almost got a PMO crossover, but the the reverse head and shoulders theme is, is continues to play out on this. And uh, the uh, upside target on, on uh, WTIC would be around $76. That's not... You know, I'm not saying it's going to go there, but that's that's a good upside target. Yeah, it does match up pretty well with the the resistance here and the support back here that we saw in 2012. <clears throat> TLT daily. Okay, more um, schizophrenia. We've got breakdown yesterday from the rising triangle. And then today it tried to get back up in there, but failed to do so. The PMO, the weekly PMO is, uh, I'm sorry, that's the daily, is uh, starting to drift downward. Okay. The weekly. And the weekly, is, yes, here we see the trading range, a two year trading range, which that would be my upside target for the. Uh, for for a bonds, right. bonds. Mm -hmm. yeah the PMO is looking pretty good too right it's just a little bit of a look like a little curl on the end of it uh, there not in the uh, what do you call it? it's not not in the not thumbnail really but thumbnail but there you can kind of see but all right. Okay, so let's look at some bonus material. We have some time here to have some discussion. I know we had started uh, making a comparison between the accumulation distribution line and the on balance volume or OBV. Uh, so I'm gonna, I, we have more time today. So I'm gonna let you take it from here and uh, tell us what you're seeing. Okay, well, uh, Tom originally um, suggested I ch check the the difference or make some comparisons between OBV and accumulation distribution. Accumulation distribution is calculated by uh, 
you you add the volume or subtract it based on whether the price closes in the top or the bottom of the daily range. So this seems like a you know where is the the on balance volume just add the volume subtract it based on whether the the price closes up or down. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the accumulation distribution looks comparison uh, to OBV as a scalpel, whereas OBV being a, a, a machete. Right. Uh, but uh, as smart as it seems like it ought to be, it, it really isn't that smart, I didn't think. And uh, it's a matter of uh, you, know, you can see, starting back on the left side, you can see we've had confirm confirmations uh, on the accumulation distribution, confirmations are not of much use. I mean, it's helpful, but what you really want to see is when things get out of gear. And on OBV, you can see that the you had negative divergences uh, there, and then there's uh, there, and and there, and then we have a positive divergence there in uh, April. There you go. And there, and uh, beginning of this year, so uh, and we do see uh, in those last two cases that uh, accumulation distribution did uh, make those signals as well. It did give the divergences, mm -hmm. but overall, I I still I think OBV uh, does the trick. I'm I've really I worked with it many years, but I, I haven't really appreciated. How well it works, and, and to, you know, and I didn't really understand it as well as, as I did in the last year or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know people kind of downplay the the OBV because it is it is a pretty simple calculation. I mean, if the day is up, then all then you add all that volume to uh, you know the, yesterday's news. But yeah, with accumulation distribution, you're looking at where it closes versus where it opened and, um, you know, slicing it up like you're saying. So I, I like the OBV just because I can visualize it uh, much easier. I just I mean, only been calculated since you were like, what, 15 years old? Yes, I was I was calculating it for you on spreadsheets. I not the kind on a computer either. <laughs> This is something I wanted to point out at some point. Uh, back at the major top we had in, in uh, September, October, there was a major negative divergence of OVV uh, using um, uh, S&P 500 volume. Right. Which is different from SPY volume, SPY being the, the trading vehicle and, and the Volume means something completely different there. Uh, and I asked you if we could make a, yeah, print up a spy chart. Change that to spy. Okay. We didn't have any notations here, but you notice there is a negative divergence, but it's very slight. And uh, I, I looked at that at the time and, and I just blew it off. And I should have been looking at the uh, SP 500 uh, OBV. That, yeah, that pattern. Right. So. Yeah, we're not seeing we're not seeing any divergences at the at the moment. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait yeah. a minute. Okay. Look, look at your. Uh, you've got um, the, the top in. I can't see in December. The t December top, for example. And. Or from here. I'm looking really actually at the. And November top. Okay. So you've got uh, OBV blowing through that level, whereas the price still hasn't exceeded that level. It's about to, it looks like, but so far. So you've got a reverse divergence. And again, it's like all that volume uh, spinning its wheels can't get, can't quite get the price up there. There you are. Okay. Oops. And then the last one we're going to talk about, I think, oops, 
our bull bear bull. Yeah, this is a chart um, where I blocked out uh, bullish price patterns and in the bearish, you know, well, the bear market essentially. But the thing that that it really what strikes me is that that bear market period was so wild. It, and looking at this chart, even it does not, you can't tell it. You I mean you don't get that feeling of of the craziness of what went on then. Um, but um, you can see where price has settled down to about like it was back before the bear market started. Right, and uh, and you notice that. VIX, the VIX has uh, is getting back to where it was before the bear market. There but during go. the bear market, the VIX is well above that that line of uh, uh, about fifteen. But the main thing that you think about, or I wish I had got in at the bottom, but I don't know how you could do it with the cra how crazy the prices were acting. And we finally got, I didn't like that PMO bottom that much that we got in the end of December. I mean, it was kind of flattish and it, it didn't, it didn't uh, make me fall in love with it. But yeah. the, the uh, you see the PMO crossed over the signal line and prices started settling down. So in my mind, that was a reasonable spot for somebody to say, Okay, I, I think I can put my foot back in the water, my toe anyway, and right. uh, uh, and that really, I, I, I just I guess it just demonstrates um, a good way to keep your keep on an even keel, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's uh, it, it, I I know everybody's hey you didn't call the bottom I missed out on all of this move to the upside. Um, but the thing is, at least for me, um, I was able to get out. <laughs> you know, yeah. I got out early because things were getting really weird. Um, you know, so I, I moved to cash like right in the beginning of December. I mean, everything. Um, and so I didn't have to endure this. And if you did, you're only now probably coming back even with what you lost during that big decline. So I think, you know, we missed out on, uh, you know, I missed out on a lot of this move to the upside. I did start to dip my toes in the water about mid-January uh, with some ETFs, but very interesting, you know, uh, I, and I have to tell people, and I told them it when I went to cash, I would rather uh, not ride that roller coaster down and then miss upside uh, because if you get that move down, you, you have to make up a lot of ground above here in order to make up for the losses you took right here. Yeah, and the, I think the, that uh, the markets moved about 20% from the December low. You know, and I think you could have captured, you know, reasonably captured a half of that if you, you know, had got in around where I should said there and I mean I'm people a lot smarter than I am about this so and I'm sure that made some money oh uh, not too many money on it. but uh, well um you know it was great having you here again and uh you know now that you're a regular but it's time to close out I want to thank everybody for being with us and uh, fill out that survey at the bottom of the viewer if you get a chance and we'll see you here next Friday at 4 30 p.m eastern happy trading <laughs>